Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today we bring you Bookshelf, an episode dedicated to the books we're each reading outside of book club, the ones we get to pick and choose. On my list, I have Voices from the Western Shore by Ursula Le Guin, one of my all-time favourite authors, and A Woman in the Polar Night by Christiane Ritter. And on mine, I have Steamy Fantasy, House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Maas, and Thoughtful Nonfiction, Don't Touch My Hair from Emma DeBerry. Keep listening to hear what we thought of them, and whether or not any should go to the top of your TBR pile. All that coming up, here on the Book Club Review. So nice to see you. We haven't had a chat about books for a while, so I am dying to know what you've been reading lately. Well, I'm ahead of you because I know what you've been reading because of our excellent new <laughs> newsletter, which is really Kate's <laughs> newsletter, to be clear. It is great. And I have just received your latest. So I have a teaser of one of the books you're going to be discussing today. Is it Sarah J. Mass? House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Mass. You and I, we love a fantasy read, right? We're keen fantasy readers. Big fans. I mean, you know, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's something we both admit that we dip into when we feel like a bit of escape. It's fun, isn't it? Fantasy. It's about escaping into a crazy imaginary world. And one of the enjoyable things about it is the inventiveness on the part of the author. One of the things that you want is something that's wildly different from reality. And so I was intrigued by this book by Sarah J. Maas. She is hugely successful, principally for her earlier books, which are YA novels, and they're based on fairy tales. So one was based on Cinderella, and it was like a reimagining of Cinderella as oppressed slave girl who turns out to have fantastic power and comes good. And then the next one was a reimagining of Beauty and the Beast, where again, Beauty turns out to be a kick-ass heroine with strong powers of her own, you know, a woman to be reckoned with. You're seeing a theme here with the Sarah J. Maas heroine. Yes. And so in House of Earth <laughs> and Blood, I was interested because it was her first book that was not marketed as YA. It's firmly aimed at adults and it's not based on a fairy story. It's a new world and new characters that she's come up with. And I just thought, oh, that sounds great. And people just go crazy about her and her books on social media. And that always interests me as well. If there's a real buzz about something, I'm curious. I want to know, am I missing out on something amazing? So of course, I dipped in and I downloaded it and started reading. And the first thing to know about it is it's incredibly long. It's 800 pages long. <laughs> long is fine. I like long. But should it have been 800 pages? I mean, that's a real question. <laughs> with a definite answer. Yeah. <laughs> so much of it is exposition. And it's really interesting idea she's created about this world where humans live with supernatural beings and they can be anything. They're all quite familiar. You know, you've got vampires, you've got werewolves, you've got angels. But what's quite pleasing is this mashup. It's like every supernatural, fantastical creature you've ever read about all living in one universe, one world together. Is it our world? Well, it's it sort of very, world? it's a vaguely futuristic sense of our world. So, for example, they have office blocks and they have mobile phones that still need passcodes. I was really hung up on this. <laughs> like, they've all got these crazy supernatural powers. And not only are they still using phones, which is one odd thing, but that the phones need passcodes, like seven digit passcodes. I was like, come on. <laughs> is this important to the plot or just a random fact thrown in there? No, it's just something that bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> And you've got your heroine. Her name is Bryce Quinlan. And she is a 25 year old who is half human, half fae, half fairy. And on her fairy side, her father is the Autumn King. So some kind of incredibly powerful fairy figure. But he's disowned her and we don't quite know why. You don't really hear much about her human mother. And then you've got Hunt, who is an angel, a fallen angel dark angel mm. because he mm. is basically a killer he has to do this because of a contract he's under because of the whole rebellion that he led that failed and so as a result of that his punishment is that he must now work to kill for the angels who are in charge until he somehow redeemed himself in their eyes and he's got to kill <laughs> by killing two, <laughs> he's got to kill something like two thousand people <laughs> 
I know. Bad people? And so he's very tormented about that because he doesn't like it. He doesn't like all the killing. He doesn't want to be a killer. And she, meanwhile, is devastated because of the death of her best friend, Danica, who was a werewolf, very powerful leader of the werewolf pack, the most powerful werewolf. And she dies in slightly mysterious circumstances. And Bryce witnesses the demon that seems to have killed her. And so Bryce is then determined to hunt down this demon and avenge her death and also just find out why, like what happened, you know, why was her friend murdered? And so there's that. And then Bryce and the angel hunt end up working together. And then there's this simmering romance going on between them that's always bubbling away under the surface. The best way to describe it, I think it was summed up very neatly by someone writing The Telegraph who said it was like E.L. James, Fifty Shades of Grey, mixed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer and a bit of Game of Thrones. And I thought, yeah, that kind of nails it. The E.L. James <laughs> is because the writing is, you know, Sarah J. Mass started out writing fan fiction. And I think the thing about fan fiction that's quite interesting is that in fan fiction, I don't think the quality of the writing is important in evaluating whether or not it's good fan fiction. I think fan fiction has a whole different criteria around what makes it mm. good. And I very much mm. think that you get that with these novels. You know, these are not novels where the quality of the writing is what's important. In fact, it's almost irrelevant because you're just so hooked by this relationship and will they, won't they, and, you know, some quite steamy scenes every so often. <laughs> <laughs> and that really pulls you through. And so I, I, it's so long. For about the first 450 pages, I was really just getting my head around who everybody was and what was going on and thinking, oh, my goodness, this is just exhausting. And then I'd say by about page 600, I started to realise <laughs> that I was actually kind of invested in this relationship between these two main characters and also in the various different plot threads. And then, honestly, it was the last 150 pages. So, yeah, page 650. Actually, suddenly, she builds up into this amazing throw everything but the kitchen sink at it ending. I mean, really, there was just nothing that wasn't thrown at this ending. It was epic on every possible level. And it was completely gripping. And I really was just mesmerized. And all of these plot threads that previously had seemed tangential and unimportant and like, why is this here? And just, you know, random. Suddenly, you're like, oh, 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 it all happens in the last 150 pages. And so by the end, I, despite myself, was completely hooked, really invested, even though I still thought it was ridiculous. I cared. I did care. I finished it and I was just like, what has just happened? What is going on? I thought everything about this book was, you know, it wasn't great. <laughs> like the writing wasn't great. The kind of experience of reading it even wasn't that great. And yet, and yet, and yet, I kind of enjoyed it. If you offered me the sequel, she hasn't written the sequel yet, but if you offered it to me, I would absolutely take it off you and go away right now just to read it. I kept stealing away from my family so I could curl up and read this. <laughs> I kind of miss those characters. Knowing, I want to know more about them. Knowing you as a reader, I'm just going to let listeners into the fact that you are a masterful skim reader. And so I'm going to guess of those 800 pages, you probably read in detail only about half of the content. Are you saying that because I seem a bit hazy on the plot point? Because in my defence, I'd say that I don't think Sarah J. Mass does a very good job of explaining them. It's all very unthought through, but it doesn't matter. You don't mm. care because you're just on to the next thing. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know, how long is War and Peace? I mean, War and Peace is about, what, 650 pages? No, isn't it 1,200? No, it's, you just is read it that it. long? I felt like it probably wasn't quite as long as House of Earth and Blood, which just felt like eternity. War and Peace is longer. The point being sure. that you, you couldn't read War and Peace in three days, but I had no trouble whatsoever reading House of Earth and Blood in three days. There's nothing about it that really holds your attention. There is no sentence that you're going to linger over because you feel like it gives you a new idea or it enriches your life in some way. I mean, there's nothing lasting about this except for quite a pleasurable experience and this fantasy you know I was thinking what is the fantasy here apart from the romance which is pretty fantastical because he's just so he's a killer and he's a deadly angel with lightning in his knuckles but he's also very sweet quite sensitive very caring asks how he's feeling turns up when he says he will you know <laughs> it's all quite sweet but no the fantasy I think is this idea of this young woman who has agency and power and when people threaten her or abuse her, she is able to fight back. And I just think there's something really compelling about that. 
you know, as a woman reading it, and I think as a young woman reading it, which I think is really the target audience here. That's the other thing. I felt a bit like, well, you know, I'm not sure about it. But then I thought, well, this is not really for me, is it? But, you know, then I felt a bit excluded. Like, well, why can't I read this? You know, <laughs> Honestly, I cannot tell you. I have been so conflicted about my feelings about this book and this experience of reading this book. You know, it's really thrown up just a massive existential reading crisis. Well, I don't want to have too much of a segue in response to that. But I recently discovered that there is a whole cohort of novelists, I think they might be predominantly American, who write Regency romances in the Georgette Hare style. Mm. Isn't this where Bridgerton comes from? I haven't read those ones, but yes, I mean, same genre, yeah. right? I just read A Fall from Grace by Jenny Goutet. And, you know, it was a passable imitation. I quite enjoyed mm. it. But then I went on to the follow-up, which is about the sister of the love interest in the previous book, Philippa Holds Court. And I got about a third of the way into that. And like you, was very conflicted. I'm like, what am I doing reading this? This is awful. And yet somehow, and yet, and yet. it's so predictable. And unlike George at Hare, George at Hare is a great writer. So you can really enjoy the conversation between her characters, the historical detail, how accurate it is. Jenny Goutet is none of those things. And so like you, I was feeling very conflicted, not least with the gender politics. I mean, the main dilemma in Regency romances is like not to be left alone with a man because he might rape <laughs> you. And that's just kind of taken as part of the frisson of everyday life as an aristocratic woman. Anyways, I don't think I'm going to read Sarah J. Mass. You have not sold it well, on me. Well, listen, I have come up with a new theory, which I think will allow me to go forward. And that's this, you know, the idea of carbon offsetting, you know, so if your company yep. you're going to do things that use carbon, you can then offset that by planting trees or doing mm -hmm. some ecological thing to balance out your use. I think maybe reading, I need to think about my reading in these terms. You know, if I'm going to spend three days of my life reading something like Sarah J. Mass, then I need to offset that by reading something that's good and nourishing and enriching and is actually going to improve my brain instead of just switching it off temporarily. Well, I have the book for you. <gasps> What's that? I have the perfect companion book, in fact, which is by Ursula Le Guin and is a fantasy novel and features a strong young female heroine and yet is so thought provoking and nourishing and rewarding and shows exactly what fantasy can be by a master of the genre. You've read the Ursi yes. Amazing. But a long time ago, right? Mm, Not recently. Well, when we did The Left Hand of Darkness, I had never read her before that. So then after we did The Left Hand of Darkness, I then went off to read Earthsea. Oh, okay. And my mind was blown. Yeah, those are amazing listeners. But I only discovered when I went into the best bookshop in Vancouver, which is called The Paper Hound, very nice bookshop, that she wrote another fantasy trilogy. I was like, how did I not know that? My husband bought me almost every single Ursula Le Guin book last birthday and yet somehow missed this one. Maybe because it was published recently. The Library of America does these beautiful editions. The Library of America, a nonprofit organization, champions our nation's cultural heritage by publishing America's greatest writing in authoritative new editions. And they're beautiful cloth bound editions. They all have a quite similar jacket, which you can take on or off depending on your preference. And in the paper hound, I picked this up and was like, wait a second. The Annals of the Western Shore, which is all one volume here, has three novels in it. Gifts, Voices, Powers. You open the front cover and there's maps, wonderful maps of a fantasy world. You like world. a map, don't you? I remember this. I'm excited. <laughs> I love a map. I read the first novel, which was very good, but really to me was the setup for the second novel, Voices, where we meet Memmer of the House of Galvamand in Ansel. And Memmer lives in Ansel 15 years after it has been conquered and occupied by the Alds, who are a desert people who came in, raped, pillaged, and burnt all of the books that were in Ansel at the time because they see books as blasphemy to their own gods. And then the Alds stayed put. I mean, you wouldn't find this in most commercial fantasy novels. From the very beginning, you know that Memmer is the child of this siege. Her mother was of the House of Galvamand, as I say, and her father, she'll never know. He was an old who raped her mother. And then when she was three, her mother died and she was left to the care of another woman in this household and to the care of the Waylord, who was kind of like the Lord of Ansel, but he was an elected representative to go around and trade with the other cities. 
So this is 15 years on when we meet Memmer, and the story begins with her entering a hidden library that only she can access by running her fingers over a stone wall. And it's something that her mother taught her. She doesn't really remember ever being taught it, but obviously this is where her mother took her when the city was under siege and they hid for some time. Memmer's been going to this library as long as she can remember. She can't read, incidentally, but, you know, she'll flip through the books and she's named the books. And she's discovered there by the Waylord, who she never knew could also access this library. And it turns out they are the only two people who can because they are of a certain line. They're the protectors in a way. And the Waylord, who's quite a distant figure, had never realized that she would be able to go there. And he teaches her how to read. And then the story really picks up when two characters reappear from the first novel, which is called Gifts. And one of them is a storyteller. And he performs for the Ald's leader in the city and takes Memmer with him. And you have this incredibly nuanced portrait of a young woman grappling with her hatred of these people, these occupiers, and being forced to confront their humanity and her own history because she is of this people too. You know, she has the same hair, which is described as like sheep's hair and the self-loathing she feels around that. And then the story just really picks up because you have a rebellion brewing and there's going to be a plot against the Alds and it just zips along from there. But it's so nuanced and thoughtful. And even though it's entirely fantastical, it's also entirely believable just in this story of the oppressed and the oppressor and how they interact with one another and how you might move forward from that peacefully or through violence. Nothing's glorified. Nothing's clear cut. You know, there's not the baddies and the goodies. And the magic that does bubble up as the story continues is dark and it's terrifying and it's frightening to Memmer. And that's true of Ursi, I think, too. I think one of the reasons Ursula Le Guin loves delving into fantasy is because of the power and responsibility that comes with magic which is so different, right, to like most commercial fantasy where it's just about like, oh, look what I can do, look what I can do. And people don't really have any critical thinking about those abilities. Mm. You should read Voices from Annals of the Western Shore because it is truly enriching and really good. And you know what's funny? I always feel I slightly judge an author based on how much I want to read their next book. But with Ursula Le Guin, when I read one of her novels... I can't read another one for a couple months because they are such a pleasure to read, but they're also quite exacting. Mm. You have to read every sentence. Mm -hmm. You can't skim read Mm. it. Everything is so crafted. It's really good. And the edition is beautiful. So you could order yourself one as a treat. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I think, yes. I was thinking about Ursula Le Guin as I read Sarah J Maas because I was just thinking, what's the opposite of this? It's Ursula Le Guin. It's fantasy where every sentence is beautifully crafted. And it's packed with ideas. And sure, it's a fantasy world. Everything is made up and imagined, but it's one that you can believe in. And also it's used as a platform to explore ideas, as you say, maybe about race or power or femininity. I mean, The Left Hand of Darkness is a really, really, really interesting exploration of gender. And she was way ahead of her time in bringing that up to the fore in the way that she did. So I guess, yeah, deep down, that is the kind of fantasy I want to read. But they're hard to find. Interesting you mentioned hair there. Because that brings me on to my next book, which is called Don't Touch My Hair by Emma Dabiri. And this is a book about black hair and the culture around that. And almost everything to do with that, because it turns out that so many issues to do with race and identity and belonging and community and well, just almost everything really, can be related back to hair. And Emma DeVere, her mother is Irish and her father is Nigerian. And she grew up in Ireland, although as a young child, she also lived in America for a while. So she experienced what being black was like in America, like her black identity there, which was very different to her identity as a mixed race child in Ireland. On the one level, it's her own story. She interweaves her own experiences. It's sort of her memoir with this incredibly interesting, thoughtful exploration of black hair and culture and how it's a part of the way that black people have been marginalized and repressed through history. And it's such an interesting way of 
coming at it. Uh, my book club had read Americana and one of the things that we had all loved in that novel, and it was funny, like it sort of takes you by surprise how much you like it, but sections of that novel are set in a hair salon where the main character, Ifemelu, has gone to have her hair braided. And I, I know all about it now, but when I read Americana, I didn't have a sense of like how long that process takes. I mean, it takes hours. I mean, if you think about it, it seems logical, actually. If you think about how complicated those hairstyles are, they take hours and hours. Just for example, one of the kind of little tangents that she goes off on from this idea of how long this braiding technique takes is this sense of time and the idea that black women find it hard to give up the time that they need to in order to look after their hair in this way. And they're made to feel like it's a waste of time, that they shouldn't be spending their time in this way. And then think about those words I just used, you know, time as a commodity, so something that we spend or we waste. And that that's very alien to the African idea of time, which is very different, which is not measured in sort of minutes and hours of a day, but much more a rhythm of tasks to be done. And there, braiding would have been a social thing. It would have been done by someone close to you. And it may have taken hours. It may have taken days. But that, that time was a really important part of life there. And it really mattered that time in terms of strengthening the bonds between people and relationships. And one of the things I really took from this that I thought she portrayed really beautifully was what has been lost. She makes a really interesting case. You know, obviously, the loss to Africa through the colonization and exploitation by Europeans of that continent, you know, is incalculable. And she does a really, really good job of showing you what has been lost. But it's, it's, it's a sense that it's not just Africans who've lost something. We too have lost something so precious. And we didn't even see it. Our ancestors, when they went over there, they only saw what they could take. And they took it. And what she leads you towards is a real understanding of the potential that was lost in that pillaging that went on. It's hard to describe. I'm not doing a very good job of summing it up, but it's just, it's such a fascinating Oh, I think you are. Book. Oh, I loved it so much. I loved every page. And look, you can see my copy. It's just covered in post-it notes because this is the kind of book where you want to read it slowly. So every two or three pages, I would just stop because I wanted to think about and reflect on something that she had just told me. And it left me thinking about things in a totally different way. And I love it when that happens when you read something. And it's not didactic. It's quite gentle in a way. And yet at the same time, it's fierce. There are moments when she talks about her experiences, when she flags up experiences. There's a section at the end about cultural appropriation and Kim Kardashian wearing braids. And you sense her frustration at what that means to people who for generations had things taken from them. and now. Even their hairstyles are being appropriated. And it wasn't something I really knew that much about. And I just found it fascinating. It's so interesting. And it's beautifully written. It's just a wonderful book, really. It's <laughs> I know I always say this. <laughs> this is now shot to the top of my best things that I've read this year list. But it was great. I absolutely loved it. And I recommend it so highly. I think for a book club, it would be great. It's not a quick read. I mean, it's the absolute opposite of flying through something in three days. It's ridiculous. I've read this slowly and I've read this really thoughtfully. But it would be so great for book club because there's just so much in it. There's so much to discuss. And I think it's one of those books where you're just different when you finish it to the way you were when you started it. And I love that. Did you know that Chris Rock did a documentary called Good Hair back in 2009? Well, because even within the black community, it turns out that there is this hierarchy of hair and that it's not so much the colour of her skin that marks her out. She's actually quite light-skinned. It's her hair. It's her kinky hair. Because mm. within mm. black hair types, you've got her kind of hair, which is very frizzy and kinky, and then, you know, it can go anything from that to you see people with more relaxed curls. People even have waves if people have got, you know, different kind of heritage in their backgrounds leads them to different hair types. But also we're very familiar with a kind of smooth style. Like if you think Michelle Obama, those smooth waves, mm -hmm. I haven't mm -hmm. really thought about mm -hmm. it that much, but that's done through chemical relaxer that relaxes the curls and gives mm -hmm. you those smooth waves. But those chemicals are really bad. They're not good to use. <laughs> They're going to burn your skin. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's like, why should black women feel that they need to do this to their hair in order to be socially acceptable by who? By the white elite. Mm. And then for a woman as powerful mm. as 
Michelle Obama. We read her memoir, Becoming, which is an incredible book. I don't remember her mentioning her hair once. I don't remember her talking about how mm. long it took to do. I don't remember her agonizing about how she wore it. And it's funny, having read this, I'm interested now in that. I think, wow, okay, it must have been tricky for her because it turns out that actually the way she wore her hair was a more political statement than I can ever have imagined. And I think the only other thing I'd say is it's not the same. It's in no way the same. But I did feel, as a woman, you can identify really easily because we have easy, white, Western hair. But nonetheless, we still spend hours in the hairdresser. The way our hair looks is very important. It's just something that women have to think about a lot. It'd be nice if we didn't, but we do. Mm. It's mm. not the same, mm. but I found it incredibly easy to access and understand because in some small way I have a sense of that idea that yeah I've got a lot of grey in my hair I've actually got slightly worryingly in lockdown I discovered I've got a couple of hanks of white and there's no question to me I'm like oh my gosh and I go to the hairdresser and she carefully covers it all up with these beautiful blonde highlights and it's just really interesting that I feel I need to do that do mm. I you know I don't know so yeah it's just I think reading it as a woman it's also incredibly interesting and relatable from that point of view it sounds great. And ever since reading Americana, I've been really interested to learn more about that experience. And I've never been able to watch Chris Rock's Good Hair because I could never find it on any streaming platform. But just looking now, I think it might be on Amazon Prime in Canada. Mm. And it sounds fascinating. It looks at the economics behind black hair and the staggering amount of revenue in the industry generated by people who own less than a percent of the industry. So, you know, the industry is run by white people. Yeah. But the revenue is coming from black people. And that, what does that inequality mean? Yeah, it's so good. Well, on to a book that was a total pleasure for me as well and recommended by you, A Woman in the Polar Night by Christiane Ritter, which you've never talked about. No, I don't think I did. We need to have these bookish chats more often. <laughs> I know, I know. So, listeners, in 1933, Christiane Ritter reluctantly followed her husband to Spitsbergen, an Arctic island north of Norway. For her, the Arctic was just another word for freezing and forsaken solitude. The story that follows is compelling, the writing matter of fact yet magical. That's very succinct, but very good blurb, mm. I think. Christian Richard was Austrian. She was from an aristocratic background. And her husband had just left her for a number of years to go live on Spitsbergen, which is now called Svalbard. And so he said, oh, you know, you really must come and join me. So she does in this slightly ridiculous trip on a cruise ship, right, surrounded by Germans who are going to explore the Arctic Sea. And she just gets dropped off in the hope that someone will come and collect her. And it's all very haphazard. And she doesn't even have word from her husband until she's like right there. And you're like, is how? What? what? And throughout... You just think, how can you survive this experience? And yet they do. Mm. And, you know, her husband has years before. When she arrives, she's going to be living in what? Maybe like a three meter by three meter shack mm. with her husband mm. for the entirety of the winter when they will be in darkness for at least four months. I think it was four months. Yeah. When she finds out that Carl is also Yeah, that's there, the hilarious and thing. Carl's a young man who's just going to be yeah. sharing the shed It's with not them. just her and her husband. And... It's this random stranger. <laughs> <laughs> who turns out to be quite delightful. And they're also going to leave her for extended periods of time. They're hunting, aren't they? They have to go off hunting. Mm. There's quite a great thread throughout where she talks about vitamins very seriously because she's terrified of getting scurvy. I mean, they all are. And it's a real risk that if they don't have fresh meat, they will have scurvy and they could die. It's beautifully written. It almost made me think I should spend a winter in the polar night. As that description says, the writing is matter of fact yet magical. I just have these vistas in my mind now that come from her writing mm. of these bleak, black mountains surrounded by white shining surfaces and the alienation that she begins to feel from her own humanity. And she nearly goes mad at some point. She has such self-discipline. When her husband and Carl have left to go hunting for two weeks, when she's not stuck inside in a roaring storm, she will go out every single day out into the freezing cold to exercise her body, to have a routine. And halfway through, you find out she has a daughter at yeah. home. She's mentioned once yeah. in passing and it sort of stopped my heart. Yeah. I was like, what? what are you doing? You have a young child at home and you and your husband are both off in the Arctic. And at the beginning of my copy, there's a little bit of an introduction where Christiane Richard's daughter was interviewed about her mother. 
And she says, actually, this experience her mother had in the Arctic completely changed her personality and her life and her approach to worldly belongings. And when their Austrian estate burnt down, Christiane was almost relieved. She had been freed from this baggage, from this history. Such a good book. I've been recommending it to everyone. How did you discover it's it? It's so great. I can't remember. No, I honestly can't. I was trying to think myself when I read it, like, why am I reading this? Who? And I, I can't remember. I must have just read about it somewhere. And um, I quite like an Arctic memoir. I'm a big fan of Sarah Wheeler's book, Terra Incognita, which is about a year she spent in Antarctica. And I was just intrigued by this. But then when I started it, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is such a gem. The writing is just amazing. And for me, the thing I remember most strongly about it is that she goes through this Arctic winter. It's black. She can barely go out. It's grueling. They don't have enough to eat. Everything is dead. It's the sort of lack of life and the inhospitable nature of the place that they're living. And then finally comes the spring and this sense of rebirth. And she is so alive to the life that's rekindling all around her and the beauty of it. And it's just so different. You know, when she arrives, she arrives in this sort of blasted beach in this sort of Spitsburg in the middle of nowhere. Nothing is anywhere. You know, there's nothing. And she's very like, oh, really, you know, this, this is it, you know, kind of thing. And when she leaves, like her, you just feel her loss. You feel that sense of loss because you see it through her eyes and she herself has been reborn. She made it through this winter and she doesn't want to leave, does she? She could imagine perhaps staying. And I think that's very magical. And also reading it, you know, in this strange lockdown we've all been going through, I think that really struck a chord. It was like, we will come through the other side. Things will change. And I think we will have learned something from this experience, hopefully, in the way that she did. And I love the fact that she lived till she was 103. She had her priorities right for the rest of her life. Yeah, she wasn't too fussed about material possessions because she knew what was important. And I love that about her. And she never wrote another book. She only wrote this. Which is crazy, I know. isn't it? Because this is so good. Fantastic yeah. <laughs> Do you want to know a fun yeah, fact? Yeah, tell me. Svalbard is one of the few, if not the only place in the world where you don't need a visa to live and work. Oh, that is an interesting fact. <laughs> because, because Norway wants people to live there and populate it. There's also a real risk that you'll be you know, attacked by a polar uh -huh. bear. That's a motif that pops up a lot in Christiane Ritter's experience. Remains true. And I'll send you a link afterwards and maybe we can put it in the show notes. But there's a little BBC feature where they interview people who live on Svalbard, who come from all over the world for, I suppose, a different way of mm. living and equally for more opportunities than they might have in their home country. Wow. Well, I don't know if I want to live there, but I would love to visit one day. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. No, I, I don't think I want to live there either. <laughs> okay. Well, we haven't talked about it at all, but would any of these books make for a good book club? Book? Don't Touch My Hair would be amazing. I think Christian Ritter would be amazing, wouldn't it? I wonder. It should be put to the test. Mm. I think it's a wonderful book, but would anyone disagree? What would you discuss? I'm not sure. Well, it might just be a universal fan I think club. it's quite interesting what she leaves out as well. Because you remember, she barely mentions the cold. And at one point, the men build her a little, maybe because she can't stand the snoring, I don't know. But for whatever reason, they build her a little extension to the tiny hut that they've got. And so she gets her own little compartment at the end of it. And somehow they manage, they put up paper. Somehow they've got wallpaper. <laughs> but anyway, at one point, she casually <laughs> mentions that the walls are always covered with an inch thick of ice. And you're just, mm -hmm. it's surprising just because normally she never mentions the cold. And you're like, oh, no, <laughs> it would have been so cold. But I think, so, so yeah, cool. so it is interesting. I think it's a really, it is interesting to think about what she put in, what she left out. And also, as my memory, it has these little drawings in it that she did. My edition had these little sketches that were her own oh, drawings. Cool. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of, I think just she's so interesting to consider and talk about. I think they'd be, yeah, I think it'd be a great one. <laughs> And I think Ursula Le Guin's voices, Annals of the Western Shore, would be a good one too, especially if you're not a regular fantasy reader. It would really show you what's possible with the genre and why it matters. And if you're in the mood for a steamy, will they, won't they, 800-page bonkbuster set in a fantasy world with a badass girl heroine and a hot merman, I didn't mention him, he was my favourite, then Crescent City, House of Earth and Blood is your book. That's nearly it for this episode. Books mentioned were House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Mass, A Fall from Grace and Philippa Holds Court by Jenny Goutet, The Western Shore Trilogy by Ursula Le Guin, Don't Touch My Hair by Emma Dabiri, Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, 
A Woman in the Polar Night by Christiane Ritter and Terra Incognita by Sarah Wheeler. On our next book club show, we'll be discussing Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death by Selina Godden, in which Death decides it's about time someone wrote her memoirs. It's been described as playful and sombre, hilarious and human, but what did Laura's book club make of it? Listen in to find out. While you're waiting, why not catch up with our recent interview with author and bibliotherapist Ella Bertut. She tells us about our new book, The Art of Mindful Reading, gives us some brilliant tips for tackling your TBR pile, that's to be read pile for those who don't spend quite as much time on Bookstagram as us. And she also has some great book suggestions if you're in the mood for adding to it. That's episode 92, out now. If you enjoyed this show, check out our website, where you can find our archive of episodes to browse through, including our most recent book club episode on the Costa-winning Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Roffey. You can also explore our library of book reviews and articles, including our favourite fantasy reads. That one is just out. If you'd like to hear more from us, sign up to our weekly newsletter for the best bookish news, recommendations and tips. You can subscribe via the link in our Instagram bio or on our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk. You can also explore our library of book reviews and articles, including our favourite fantasy reads. That one is just out. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or you can always email us at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. Drop us a line and let us know what you're reading. We always love to hear from you. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate and review the show and help other listeners find us. But for now, that's our show. Thanks for listening and happy reading.